Hey everybody, thank you for taking the time to visit the channel. I uh, just want to point out, everybody, thank you for watching my prior videos. You guys really seem to like it. And I like to deliver this factual information to you guys. So just want to say appreciate you all for watching my videos. And yeah, let's get right into it. So now, when it comes to Greek... Well, Greek, well, kind of said a little bit earlier. When it comes to Western philosophy... The name that pops up, of course, is going to have to be Socrates, as who was credited as the founder of the Western philosophy, among the first moral philosophers of the ethical tradition of thought. So I give him to that. And interesting enough, one of his students is Plato. And the reason why I say this about Socrates is when you start to research Socrates and see how he died, and I'll give you a brief little summary. Um, he was actually jailed under conspiracies to, um, <laughs> funny actually, these new ideas that were foreign to the Greeks at this time, he actually brought and they, the officials just did not want to hear anything of it. So he was jailed. And what's interesting is to me is that why would all, why would his philosophy be foreign if he was Greek, of course, and we reigned this guy so high for the Western philosophy. So then it made me think, where did he get his information? Like, who was his um, teacher, per se? And then when you look into it, you see that he visited Egypt and actually went to the mystery schools. And then this goes far from like the regular grain of education because you have to dig deep. And that's why I tell you, you guys got to do the research. You guys just can't leave things for face value. There's some things that are hidden from you guys that a lot of people don't want you guys to know or to look into. So then when you look into it, you see that, yeah, he actually learned actually from the Egyptians. So it made me want to research more into this. I was like, can Western philosophy actually be from the Egyptians and that the Greeks were taught all this and then just happened history happens to just be that only the Greeks derived all of this so then I did the research and for one thing um, of course Socrates didn't actually leave any notes because he didn't document anything so we only have information from his students and as I said earlier Plato is the, one of the most famous people, one of the famous Greeks, everybody, it's a household name, everybody knows his name. But actually Plato talks about Socrates and the credit of writing, and you'd be surprised into who Socrates, what well, Plato says Socrates credits it to, as I'll show you here in this little tab. In the Phaedrus, written circa 370 BCE, Plato recorded Socrates' discussion of the Egyptian myth of the creation of writing. In the process, Socrates faulted writing for the weakening necessity and power of memory and for allowing the pretense of understanding rather than true understanding. As I said here, so from Plato's dialogue, for it is 14, 27, 4C, 275B, Socrates. I heard then that Anacrates in Egypt was one of the ancient gods of that country, the one whose sacred bird is called the Ibis. And uh, just to point in the Ibis, he's talking about Thoth. And the name of the god himself was Thoth. Thoth, as I just explained to you. He, it was who, 274D, invented numbers and arithmetic and geometry and astronomy. Also, droughts and dice and most important of all, letters. And actually, in the same actually writing from Plato, he actually mentions Thoth again, as I'll show you here. In Phaedrus, Plato invokes a mythic exemplum concerning the Egyptian deity, deity Thoth. Though often interpreted as an overcritic of writing, this argument pulls his Thoth is offered analogically to contrast Plato's rhetorical epistemology with that of the ancient Egyptians. To do so, this argument addresses why a mythic Egyptian figure might be so significant.
to Plato in the 4th century BC. Greece, whose culture already had multiple gods and cultural heroes to whom the invention of writing is attributed, when the episode of fate is extremely described as a critic of writings, because Plato may have had some degree of first-hand knowledge of the Egyptian traditions, it explores those traditions personified in the figure of Thoth, which should be examined as an analogical device advised by Egyptian rhetorical epistemology. A closer examination of the comparative rhetorical epistemology perspective not only illuminates Thoth's appearance in Fair Dutus, but also the Egyptian rhetorical epistemic tradition. Thoth's role as epistemic mediator between humans and truth in the broadest terms was to act as psychocomp, who moves both between humanity and the arrival at knowledge that prefigures rhetorical action. So now, after showing you all this, it's clear to see, no shadow of a doubt, that Plato and Socrates were both influenced by the Egyptian culture and, well, you can actually say somewhat initiate into the mystery schools esoterically, which we'll be getting more into on this channel. But that I, that didn't stop me there. I had to keep pushing people because <laughs> I keep telling you, like, I'm crazy about all this. I mean, when I get fixated on something, when it comes to history and antiquity, I just dive deeper into it. And then you also see more about where it comes to alchemy. I thought into that where alchemy derived from. Yes, turning lead into gold. We all know this process. And if you know the process esoterically, shout outs to all the cultists <laughs> that actually know about alchemy. But if you look deep, deep into alchemy, you'll see where it derives from. Also, where all this science comes from, as you'll see here. And like I said, people, this is all common knowledge. You all can look this up. The etymology of alchemy. I'll skip the uh, top part. I'll go to here. Other traces its roots to the Egyptian name Kemi, meaning black earth, which refers to the fertile and aruphous soil of the Nile Valley, as opposed to the red desert sand. According to Egypto Egyptologist Wally's Budge, the Arabic word alchemy actually means the Egyptian science. Hmm. Borrowing from the Coptic word for Egypt, Kemi, or its equivalent in the medieval Bahiric dialect of Coptic, Kemi, this Coptic word derives from Demotic, Kemi, itself from an ancient Egyptian Kemet. The ancient Egyptian word referred to both the country of the people and the color black with the soil, Egypt with the black land, by contrast with the red land, the surrounding deserts. So this etymology could also explain the nickname Egyptian Black Arts. I mean, come on, people. I mean, just showing you all of that. So now we know that alchemy derived from straight out of Egypt, straight from Coptic Egypt, around the time when Alexandria was in, well, I I'm sorry to say Alexandria, I should say his generals, Ptolemy, was around taking control of this area. So all of this information is there. And then if you know about alchemy, then you know where I'm going to go with this then, because we all know that chemistry, of course, came from alchemy. And yes, you can not believe me, but let, let the picture speak for itself, people. Again, people, like I keep saying, you got to do the research. Etymology of chemistry. The word chemistry derives from the word alchemy, which is found in various forms in European languages. Alchemy derives from the Arabic word chemia or alchemia. The Arabic term is derived from the ancient Greek chemia, sida, I can't speak Greek, <laughs> art of allowing metals from pour out. However, the ultimate origin of the word is uncertain. According to the Oxford English Dictionary, derived from the Greek, which derived from the ancient Egyptian name of Egypt, again, people, Kem or Kem, Kem, Kemi, meaning blackness, the rich dark soil of the Nile River Valley. Therefore, 
as I keep saying to people, therefore alchemy can be seen as the Egyptian art or the black art. I mean, boom, people, there it is, right in front of our faces. Now, pretty much telling you how chemistry alls all of its foundation to alchemy, which derived from Egypt. So now, this is why I don't understand why Egypt gets a bad rap. And I think I do understand it's mainly because of the Christian Bible, as in it portrays Egypt in a bad light. But then when you do the research and you're finding out all this science and knowledge is coming straight out of Egypt, it makes you want to second guess and think about all this. And just to throw out a book, if you ever read this book, which I'll recommend here, Stolen Legacy by George G.M. James. This just blew my mind, folks. And this was, and this was me doing my own research, years of research, way before I even got this book. This is the most recently book, but he goes into it deep and just shows you how all these Greek um, philosophers, Thales, Plato, Socrates, Herodotus, which I'm going to be deep and dive soon, and we'll be going into his book. So, but all of these, all these high credible people went into Egypt and learned from the mystery schools. And one saying that you've all heard before, all heard before, man, know thyself. And then, yes, it was on top of the Greek structures, you know, when it came to their, um, to their temples. But like I said before, this was all on the temple of Luxor in Egypt. And you can all look this up. This was all in, all in the outside. Know thyself. And, and if any historian knows this, this lets you know that this was the mystery schools that they all went through to learn. So, yeah. But now I want to show you some deep scholarly work. And we're going to be talking about Herodotus. Yes, and this man right here, I'm telling you, he just spells it out to you all. I mean, if you had any shadow of a doubt of what I just explained and showed you, eh, maybe, yeah, they could have been there. But once you know Herodotus and if you deep, really unbiased research, because I know a lot of people are going to turn their heads and not even going to take the time to watch the video and to actually see if there's anything to com commemorate all of this, but I'm telling you without a shadow of the doubt, you can't be biased and you just gotta do the research and you'll see. So once again, let's get into this presentation right now. All right, guys. National Library of Medicine. So you can do your due diligence and look this up also. But in an abstract, it says here, Egyptian medicine is the base of Greek medicine. Hmm. Egyptian people and their medical knowledge are often mentioned in the Iliad and Odyssey of Homer, one of the Greeks I just showed you in the prior picture. Many Greek doctors, such as Malapus, Asops, and as well as Hippocrates, I butchered most of their names, I'm sorry guys, <laughs> visited Egypt to study and understand medicine. Okay. This work intends to focus particularly on Homer, Herodotus, and Plutarch's letters, where the importance of Egypt in religion, science, and medicine is clear. Herodotus 484 through 420 BCE in the second book of the Histories, which I'll be showing you guys later. I'll be showing you passages from the book a little bit later because I own the book describes Egypt and the medical knowledge of its doctors. Plutarch, 1 through 2, CE, in the virtues of Sparta and life of Lococcus, tells about an energy beverage named nephetine, made with drugs from Egypt. And another Greek philosopher that we all know, well known as Plato, which actually chimes in also. So I'll show you guys a quote from him here also. Plato in Egypt. Damien went on from there. Plato traveled to Egypt with Euripides to meet with Egyptian 
philosophers, and priests. During his stay, he became very ill, but was cured by a priest using a co cognition made of seawater. This caused Plato to concur with Homer that the Egyptians surpassed all mankind as healers. So even Plato is commending Homer unto what he said when it came to their medicine. But I'll continue. Every man is a healer there. Homer, Odyssey 4, 229 through 232. He also learned about the water clock and brought the idea back to Greece. As you know, the Egyptians were the first to invent a portable timekeeping device. And as you see here, this is the Egyptian water clock dated 1400 BC. And to put into context, as you see also, the Greeks telling you that they got most of their ideas and their way of living, astrology, astronomy, science from the Egyptians. But I'll finish up here. The most important thing is that it was in Egypt that Plato was exposed to many new ideas from the philosopher priest, which in turn formed the nucleus of what would become his philosophy and his theory of forms. So now, after just showing you three Greek philosophers and, and showing you how they all contested as to going into Egypt and having numerous encounters where it comes to their, to their medicine and how it helped them and actually brought some of their ideas to Greek. So, and after showing you the website that you can go look up to, Homer and Herodotus contributing towards their, the medicine in Egypt and, have, and it being the basis of medical for the Greeks. But if you study Homer and Herodotus, I have to point this out because I'm going to have, if people do the research, like I hope you guys do, you're going to run into this. They're going to say they may be a little bit pseudo or, oh, that they made all this stuff up. And, I, well, let's say we can contest that. But if you know about Herodotus, you'll know that since in his book he quoted of this lost city of city of Harsalon that was submerged in upper Egypt and for thousands of years everybody thought it was a myth they thought it didn't exist until we found it and I'll show you the article here and before I continue just want to show you guys the book, the landmark Herodotus, the histories, where we get history from. The first Greek historian, Herodotus, was an ancient Greek historian and geographer from the Greek city of Halicarnassus, part of the Persian Empire, now Bergen, Turkey. He is known for having written the histories, a detailed account of the Greco-Persian Wars. Herodotus was the first writer to perform systematic investigation of historical events. He is referred to as the father of history, a title confirmed on him by the ancient Roman orator Cicero. Um, I'll leave all the rest of you guys to read, but I want to come down here where I highlight it. Herodotus has been criticized for his inclusion of legends and fanciful accounts in his work. The fellow historian Thucydides accused him of making up stories for entertainment. However, Herodotus explained that he reported what he saw and what was told to him. A sizable portion of the his stories has since been confirmed by modern historians and archaeologists. And as I said earlier, they found this lost city due to the writings that Herodotus had in his stories. And I'll show you the link to the article here. History of Donus Herslin. For more than four centuries until the foundation of Alexandria in 331 BCE, Donus reigned supreme over the canopic portion of the Nile River. 
The Greek historian Diodorus of Sicily wrote about Donna Circlin in his great work, but in his great work, Bibliotheca Historia, between 60 BC and 30 BCE, sometime in the 5th century BC, Herodotus, like I just said, wrote that the Greek god and hero Heracles, Hercules, actually first stepped foot onto Egypt at this port city. Thus, the Greeks gave Thonus the name Harslian and built a grand temple dedicated to him. Herodotus also said Paris and Helen of Troy visited the port city. So serious. The primitive Egyptian port Donus Herklin was lost at the bottom of the sea for 1,300 years. Like I just said, Herodotus wrote this in his book and histories. The Egyptian city of Donus Herklin was the main port of entry to the Mediterranean Sea. Between the 8th century BCE and the 4th century BCE, by the 8th century CE, what remained of the city sank into the sea and eventually became a distant memory without any trace except for a few reverence in historical writings. The forgotten ruins rested undisturbed until the 21st century in 2000. The European Institute of Maritime Archaeology, led by renowned archaeologist Frank Guria, finally discovered the city's treasure in the depths of the Obikir Bay. And this is where they found the lost city. As you can see, it's a little bit off from the city of Alexandria in Egypt. But yeah, as you see there, that's where they found it. And it was submerged in water, just like what Herodotus contested to in his book. So now, after showing you that and that um, Herodotus written down about this lost city, and that us actually finding it contests to what he said in his book. And like I said before, I have the book. So this is why I show you guys. I'm not one of those YouTubers that just shows you the pictures. I actually own the book and do my due diligence. So that's why I can say I can vouch for some of the stuff that Herodotus contests to when he talks about Egypt. And like I said, I want to show you some passages from the book, Historias, quoting from Herodotus what he says pertaining to Egypt. So now, page 118 on book two. Book two of Egypt. It says here by Herodotus, got it here highlighted. As to all matters concerning the human world, they were in agreement. They said that the Egyptians were the first of all peoples to discover the year by dividing up the seasons into 12 parts to total one year. What does that sound like, guys, to you in the Western civilization? What does that sound like? And that they discovered how to do this from the stars, astronomy. The Egyptians seemed to me to be much wiser than the Hellenists in a way that they regulate the timing of the seasons. I'll get back to the definition of Hellenists in a second. While the Hellenists attempt to preserve the timing of the seasons by inserting an interclearly month every other year, the Egyptians divided the year in 12 months of 30 days each and add just five days each year beyond that number. And thus their season do return at the same periods in a cycle from year to year, duality. They said that the Egyptians were also the first to establish the tradition of identifying names for the 12 gods and that the Hellenists adopted this practice from them. They were also the first to assign altars, statues, and temples to the gods and to carve their figures in relief on stone. So you can see from what Herodotus is claiming that the Greeks got all of their customs, especially when it came to their altars and their rituals from the Egyptians. And that word Hellenists, I want to give you a brief definition so you know who, exactly who he's talking about. So as we see here, Helene, now Hellenists, an ancient Greek even a native of modern 
Greece, chiefly in the title of the now exiled royal family. So you see exactly who he's referring to when he's saying that they make up claims or that they're following, that the Hellenists are following the Egyptians. These are the Greeks. Herodotus himself is a Greek too. The next insert, I want to show you page 144 so you guys can see also book two, page 144. In any case, the Egyptians were the first of all peoples to hold public religious festivals, pageants, and processions escorting divine images, remember now, and the Hellenists, well, since I gave you the definition, I'm going to just say, and the Greeks learn about these rituals from them. My proof for this assertion is that Egyptian ceremonies have obviously been held for a very long time, but those of the Greeks have been instituted only recently. The Egyptians come together to celebrate major festivals, not just once, but many times a year. The most popular festival takes place at the city of Bobistis in honor of Artemis. And if you know Greek mythology, you know who that is. The second most popular festival honors Isis, an Egyptian moon goddess, at the city of Bosphorus. An Egyptian city situated in the center of the delta where the most important sanctuary of Isis is located. Isis is in the Greek language is Dem Demeter. Hmm. If you know Greek mythology, you know about Demeter and especially in page 136, book two, Herodotus. Let's do it. All those who establish a sanctuary of Theban Zeus or of the Theban Nome sacrifice goats but not sheep. For Egyptians do not all worship the same gods in the same way. Only the gods Isis and Osiris, the latter of whom they say is Dionysus, remember that, the connection, are worshipped in the same manner by all Egyptians. For example, those who have a sanctuary of Mendes or of the Mendesian district sacrifice sheep, but not goats. Now the Egyptians and all who followed their practice abstained from sacrificing sheep and claimed that their custom originated in this manner. Heracles had an overwhelming desire to see Zeus, who did not want to be seen by him. Finally, since Heracles kept insisting, Zeus devised the following scheme. He scanned a ram, cut off its head, wrapped himself in the fleece, and placed the head in front of his own face and showed himself thus to Heracles. That is why the Egyptians fashioned a statue of Zeus with the head of a ram. The Ammonians, who are colonists from both Egypt and Ethiopia, who speak a combination of both languages, apparently received this tradition from the Egyptians. And since the Egyptians called Zeus by the name of Ammon, it seems to me that this that the Ammonesian also received their name from the apparitions of this god. And I'll continue here. Page 137. In Egypt, book 2. Now to turn again to Heracles. I have heard it said that he was once of the twelve Egyptian gods. But about the other, Heracles, the one known to the Hellenists, I was unable to learn anything anywhere in Egypt. This is Herodotus speaking. Moreover, the fact is that the Egyptians did not take the name of Heracles from the Hellenists, but that the Hellenists, that is those Hellenists who established the name of Heracles as a son of Amphrathian, took it from the Egyptians. This can be demonstrated by many proofs, especially by the fact that both parents of Heracles and Amphrathian Alchemen were of Egyptian descent. Continue here. And this is where it gets good. Just a little bit. Since I wish to know something definite about all this from any source I can find, I sailed to Tyre in 
Phoenicia. The Phoenicians, when I learned that there was a sanctuary sacred to Heracles there. Then we're going to now let's do this. And I saw that it was decorated lavishly with many offerings. In particular, I saw two pillars in it, one of refined gold and the other of emerald so magnificent that it glowed in the dark. When I asked the priests of the god how long it had been since the sanctuary had been established, I discovered that they did not agree with the Hellenists. Remember, ancient Greek, I showed you guys earlier what Hellenists is, is the ancient Greeks. For they said that the sanctuary was founded at the same time that Tyre was settled, and that Tyre had been inhabited for 2,300 years. I also saw in Tyre another sanctuary of Heracles, this one bearing the infant Thedasian. And so I went to Thasos and found that there was a sanctuary of Heracles founded by Phoenicians who had set sail in search of Europa who had colonized Thasos, which happened in fact five generations of men earlier than birth of Heracles, son of Amphrithian and Helios. And so this research shows clearly that Heracles is an ancient divinity the Hellenists I consider the most orthodox of those who are founded and maintained to distract sanctuaries of Heracles sacrificing to one as in now I'm on page 138 trying to show you guys you all can look this up yourself grab the book book 2 to finish it off immortal with infant Halipian and to the other as a hero with offerings appropriate to the dead remember Always incorporating it and switching things up. The Greeks did this too. The Hellenists tell many different native stories. And their myth of Heracles is especially foolish. They say he came to Egypt and was crowned by the Egyptians. Who then let him direct a procession as a sacrificial victim to Zeus. He kept silent for a while. But when they led him up the altar, he turned on them with his great strength and murdered them all. The Hellenists who tell this story it seems to me are entirely ignorant of the nature and customs of the Egyptians. These people are forbidden by sacred law to sacrifice their domestic animal apart from sheep, bulls, male calves that are ritually clean and geese. So how could they conceivably sacrifice human beings? There it is, people. All the evidence right there for you in books. But the thing is, what I wanted to question is, why is all this stuff hidden from us? Why isn't all this stuff put in the forefront in the books? It's because they're trying to hide all this. They don't want you to research this stuff. After finding all of this out by just reading through books and researching other people, other cultures, and again, like I said, that was a Greek philosopher. Remember, Herodotus is Greek. So he's not Egyptian. So this gives you another reason why you can believe all this. But yeah, so as I said again, all this information, they're trying to hide it from you. They don't want to edu they don't want you guys to educate yourself or to look at Egypt in high esteem. Because when you look further back, every almost every nation around that area went into Egypt and got educated. So just wanted to point this video out that history is really well written by the winners. And if you really want to know what happened to the opponents, you're going to have to dive deep. And this is what I do on my channel. And we give, I give unbiased information. So, again, I hope you guys learned something. I hope we all can research Egypt more and we'll find out more stuff that Egypt contributed but again, thank you all for taking the time to watch this video. More content is on the way. I'm telling you, we'll be reading from the Gnostics soon, and we'll be doing more Bible verses. And we're going to see why the Gnostics thought the way that they did. Was there a reason why that they removed themselves from the early Christian sect? Hmm, maybe a different way of thinking. But we're going to get into that soon. But anyway, thank you all again for taking the time to watch these videos. I know I 
put put some time in it. They're like thirty, almost forty minutes. Um, if you guys want, I could break it down, do part one and two, get across. But I feel like my viewers, you guys are good. You guys can spend the time, sit down, and get educated. Because if you can't watch a thirty-minute video and get education, like scholarly education, like come on, and you can't even just read a book. So, anywho, thank you all for taking the time. I hope you guys enjoyed and. I'll see you all in the next video. And as always, as above, so below. Peace, everybody.